one of the things that you don't realize, people tell you that God is not concerned about your finances. Well, why did he say so doggone much about it yes. in the Bible? Yes. There is so much information on finances in the scriptures. And, and so it's, it's, it's important to me to move at a pace where you can get it, but to also not rob you of revelation by trying to cut my message down to 20 minutes. So I know that <laughs> these have not been one of those 30-minute sermons during the course of this series. And I challenge you to stay with me today. We will not be here until the rapture, but I want you to stay with me because if you get, if you every, if you get, see, these are pieces of a puzzle. And if you get every one of these pieces, gosh, gosh, we are going to watch God. Do you realize the only time God told you, go ahead and test and see, is when it dealt with money? The only, he tempt not, don't tempt the Lord your God, but the only time he said, go ahead and try, it was about money. God is concerned about our money. So let's turn to Deuteronomy chapter 8. Um, we have... We began this series with Deuteronomy 8 because in this passage, it establishes the fact that God has given us an anointing, an empowerment, an enablement to get, to procure wealth. Okay? Um, it said he has given us the power. Deuteronomy 8, as always, from the New American Standard, verse 18, and it says, But you shall remember the Lord your God, for it is he who is giving you power to make wealth, that he may, why? That he may confirm his covenant. If you are not, if you are not walking in the empowerment, doesn't mean if you're not wealthy, you can be in the process. If you are not at least walking in the empowerment to get wealth, then you are not living in the full revelation and manifestation of his covenant. Yes, his covenant applies to your money too. So he says, give you the power to make wealth, that he may confirm his covenant, which he swore to your fathers, as it is this day. All right? So in the first installment, we establish this fact that he's given us this anointing. We've established the fact that he wants us prosperous as a part of the covenant. In the next installment, we have to change our way of thinking. Now that I know where God is on this matter, God, I want my thinking to match, to line up with yours. So change what I was raised with. Change what, what experience showed me. Change my way of thinking because as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. So I cannot walk in prosperity with a prop with a poverty mentality. Amen. In order to get there and stay there, I have to have a change of thinking. And then we move from that into before we give you the hows, we have to give you the warnings. When you get wealth, when you get riches. Make sure that you rule them so that they don't rule you. Because if you have the wrong relationship with your money, it will do more harm than good. And you will be like the rich young ruler who came to Jesus and said, I want to serve you. How do I inherit eternal life? He said, well, what do you think the Bible says? He said, well, he says, you know, honor your father, honor your mother. He said, I, I've done all this stuff since my youth. Jesus said, okay, mm -hmm. I'll tell you what. Go take everything you have and sell it and give it to the poor. And the man walked away sad. Why? Because even though he was sincere in his heart, he did want to follow him. See, we, we want to judge people by, by having limits. But it, having a limit doesn't mean you weren't sincere. Amen. It's just that, oh my God, on this one you've asked too much. And so the question becomes... What is your price? See, Judas betrayed him for 30 pieces of silver. The rich young ruler betrayed him for all his wealth. The question is, what's your price? What does it take for you to deny Christ? Peter betrayed him because he needed the opinion of other people on his side. What does it take for you? Even if it's not monetarily, monetary, what does it take for you to say, God, the price you are asking is too much. I cannot pay it. And so we have to get to this place as it relates to our money that we rule the money so that the money does not rule us. It is not money that is the root of all evil. I curse that misinterpretation or that misquotation. It is not money. It is the love of money. When you have the wrong relationship with money, it produces all sorts of evil in your life. So now, now having learned how to act when you get the money, Today we're going to begin the process of getting it. 
Somebody say amen to that. That's the good news. Amen. We are ready to get in there. We're going to start off. Before we get into the practical day-to-day, -day, when I say carnal, don't think bad carnal, just, just not spiritual. Before we get to the carnal aspects of money management, you want to deal with the spiritual. Because this is, when it's all said and done, this is a spiritual thing. This is a spiritual life we're living. And if we don't have the spiritual principles down, it doesn't matter how well you budget. Okay? So we're going to talk about God's financial system. This is our fourth installment of the Prosperity Covenant, God's financial system. Does he have a system in place as it relates to finances? The answer is yes. How can he, the Bible says he teaches us to profit. How can he teach you to profit if there's no system to teach you? You can't teach somebody something that doesn't exist. I'm going to teach you math, but math doesn't exist yet. You can't teach it. They haven't, if they haven't discovered calculus, how can they teach it? Calculus has to be, be discovered and a system formed around it so that the principles and rules associated with it can be conveyed to somebody else. So if God's going to teach us how to profit, that means he has a system in place that is designed to show us how to. And that's what we're going to deal with today. So let's start with the most basic component of this system, which, of course, is the tithe. Tithes. Okay? Tithe means ten. Now, you are going to hear some words that are going to sound very, very familiar. But I want to challenge you to not think I know this already. Yeah, I know I have a tendency to hit you from the left when you're not looking. <laughs> right? So pay good attention. The tithe. Tithe means tenth. Now, the first tithe in Scripture was given by Abraham. Many people do not realize this, but the first tithe was given by Abraham in Genesis chapter 14. So let's turn to Genesis chapter 14. And let us see the first tithe that was given in Scripture. Genesis chapter 14. I want you to understand that the children of Israel, chronologically speaking, using the, the, the Pentateuch, the first five books as a chronology of the early history of mankind, of humankind, um, the, 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 the law of Moses was not handed down until Exodus chapter 20. So we're talking what winds up being over 400 years before the law, the tithe was given. And it was given in the Exodus, excuse me, I beg your pardon, in Genesis chapter 14, verse 20. I mentioned this before in passing. Abraham went and had, um, there was an alliance of kings that rebelled against a king of kings in that region. They lost um, their money and many of their people were taken captive. Abraham found out that Lot was among those captured. So he got together his band of merry men, the people he could afford to pay. It's good to have people you can afford to pay to come help you when you need some help. Abraham had a big entourage, and they got together, men of war. That means they were professional soldiers. He was paying them from the, from the time they were youngins on how to fight because, you know, when, you, when you're out in the world traveling to and fro, you need to know how to fight. When you're out in the workplace, and the, doc, and, the, and the bosses are acting crazy and the people are lying on you, you need to know how to fight. Not with these, <laughs> but with this. So he says that, so after he, they, 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 they won the fight, everything they captured belonged to Abraham because, you know, find us keepers. <laughs> All right? But Abraham brought the money back. But before he gave back to the kings their people, well, he gave them their people, but he, before he gave them their money, their, their treasure back, he took a tenth portion because those are all he is anyway. Before he gave it back, he took a tenth portion and he tithed to God. Verse 20 says this, and God, and blessed be, let's back up so you can get a little more of the, of the context. Let's go to verse 17. Then after his return from the defeat of Shedalomer and the kings who were with him, the king of Sodom went out to meet him at the valley of Sheba, that is, the king's valley. And Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. Now he was a priest of Most High God, of God Most High, El, El Elyon. And he blessed him and said, Blessed be Abram of God, Most High, possessor of heaven and earth. And blessed be God, Most High, who has delivered your enemies into your hand. And he, Abram, gave him, Melchizedek, the priest of God, a tenth of all. 
he gave him a tithe of all that he had accumulated through the defeat of this king. Okay? Now, here is the question. Where was the tithe commanded? Nowhere. So why did Abram tithe to the priest of God? Because it was in his heart. See, we have arguments in the church now about whether it's, we're commanded to tithe in the New Testament. Do our New Testament Christians supposed to tithe or whether or not because it's not a command? You're having the wrong conversation. It's not are you commanded to tithe, it's what's in your heart. Because before a command went forth, the tithe went out. Our patriarch Abraham established a pattern of acknowledging God as the source. God, all of these treasures, all of this booty that you have given me belongs to you. I only have it because you allowed me to get it. It was not my PhD. It was not my education. It was not my training. It was not my upbringing, God. It was your favor. And because I acknowledge you, before I do anything with this money, before I give it back to the king of Sodom, which was what he was going to do, but before I do anything, God, the first tip goes to you. I wasn't commanded it. It came from my heart. All right? Look over in chapter 28. The first tithe by our patriarch Abraham. Chapter 28. The second tithe, watch this here, in verse 20. Uh, this is relating to Jacob. Then Jacob made a promise. Then Jacob made a vow. Saying, if God, watch this now. If God will be with me and will keep me on this journey that I take and will give me food to eat and garments to wear. How many of y'all know he's about provision? Yeah. Okay. Just like Abraham. Abraham acknowledged God as provider. Jacob is making a promise and he is acknowledging God as provider. And he says, and I return to my father's house of safety. Then the Lord will be my God. And this stone which I have set up as a pillar will be God's house. And of all that thou dost give me, I will surely give a tenth to thee. I will surely give a tithe to you, God, in acknowledgement of the fact that you are my provider. Despite what comes out of your mouth, the tithe is an acknowledgement that God is your provider. And that acknowledgement is no more potent than when your bank account balance tells you you can't tithe. It's no more potent than then. Because that's when the rubber meets the road and you say, no, he is my provider. And as Pastor Lynn in her transparency say, listen, do you think that just because we have titles that we have become perfect people when it comes to every area of our lives? We struggle too. We have bills too. We look at our finances too and say, God, what in the world is this? And we have the added benefit of saying, God, how can I lead your people when I'm broke? And so we start beating ourselves up on other levels. But the truth is still the truth, and what's right is still right. The tithe is an acknowledgement that, God, you are my provider. Despite what they pay me, which may not be enough, you are my provider. And this acknowledgement, this pattern was established before the law even existed. Because it came from the heart. Now let's look at this purpose of tithing uh, a, a little more deeper in terms of Hebrews chapter 7. Hebrews 7, the tithe as an acknowledgement that he is our provider. Hebrews chapter 7, but there's also a, second, a secondary aspect of the tithe. They might say, you're going to Hebrews? I, I thought tithing wasn't in the New Testament. That's because you were talking to the wrong people. As Elder Sheryl said, <laughs> you thought they were wise, but they gave you the wrong information. All the people who told you they didn't tithe in the New Testament, they just didn't read the Bible closely enough. Hebrews chapter 7 and verse 8. Well, let's, I, I, I tell you what, 
I, because I gave the example in, in, in Genesis where Abraham tithed, and this is actually the context of what we're reading, let's go ahead and give you a little more context than that. So let's start off at verse, uh, verse 6. But the one whose genealogy, now when he says the one he's referring to Melchizedek, the same priest that Abraham tithed to, okay? The, the only time we saw him mentioned in Scripture was when we just read it in Genesis. We don't have any idea of when he was born, who his parents were, what his genealogy was. We don't know when he died. We don't know if he died. All we know is he existed and Abraham died. All right? So this is what he says. But the one whose genealogy is not traced from them collected a tenth. Melchizedek collected a tenth from Abraham. Traced from them, he's referring to Levi because the tribe of Levi, the Levites were the one under the law who received the tithe. Yet before the law, the tithe was given to somebody who wasn't even traced through the, Le the Levitical line. First of all, it didn't exist yet. So he says, but one whose, whose uh, genealogy was not traced from the Levites collected a tenth from Abraham and blessed the one who had the promises. He was in a position that even though Abraham had received a promise from God, the priest was still in the position to pronounce a blessing over his life. But without any dispute, the lesser is blessed by the greater. Now listen to me. I need you to hear this. Because we make a huge mistake in the, in the modern church, in this progressive church. I almost hate to use the word progressive because we didn't progress our way out of sound doctrine. Pro listen, we have got to get rid of this idea that everybody is on the same level spiritually. <coughs> the body of Christ is not an egalitarian society. Okay? There are people who are at different stages and states of their spiritual development. Okay, and it, you can't be a babe in Christ and bless someone, pronounce a blessing over someone who is a, let me call it a senior in Christ. Now that sounds bad, but that, how is that right? You can, if you pronounce a blessing, what does it say? Without any dispute, the lesser is blessed by the greater. This is the word. So we have to back away and start realizing that yes, God has given us apostles and prophets and evangelists and pastors and teachers for a reason. We, 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 we have lost a reverence for the agency of God. Remember that message I preached a while ago? The agency of God's anointed and how God's going to do some things through them, but you have to acknowledge the fact and honor the fact that God has anointed them to be a blessing in your life. That was the Old Testament. No, he gave them as gifts, Ephesians 4, to the body. All right? So we have to restore this respect for the role and function that they play in our lives because if we think that we're all on the same level as Peter seeing eye to eye, we are rejecting our ability to be blessed by the greater. So respect your leadership. Amen to that. Amen. Verse 9. Now he says, in this case, on this side of the discussion, mortal men receive tithes. Not received, past tense, not under the time of the law. No. In this case, mortal men... People that die receive tithes. But in that case, in which case, when Abraham tied to Melchizedek, who was a priest, who apparently we have no idea if and or when he died. So theologically speaking, Melchizedek is considered a type of Christ. Some people even believe he was a Christophany. He was a pre-incarnate manifestation of Christ in the earth. That before Christ came through Mary, he manifested in Melchizedek, and the, the idea is because Melchizedek had no traceable lineage and no known date of death, that it symbolized Christ who lives forever. The, later on in, in here in Hebrews, it says that Christ has become our high priest, not according to the order of Aaron through the tribe of Levi as it was set up under the law, but according to the order of Melchizedek because he lives forever. See, your priest in the Old Covenant, 
they lived and then they died. And even in the modern day, even in the church age, the people who receive the tithe live and they die. But in heaven, when you pull back the veil of the natural, the one who is actually receiving your tithe is not the church. It's not the preacher. It's the high priest who lives forever. Amen. Christ. So what is that saying? It's, watch what he says. But there he received them as a witness that he lives on. He lives forever. Now, that means that the tithe, even in the new covenant, is an acknowledgement of the priesthood of Christ. Because as the, as the tithe was given to Melchizedek, the high priest, as the tithe was given to the Levites, the priests, under the law. So now when we tithe, our tithe is given to Christ through the agency of the church, but it's given to Christ, and it is an acknowledgement that he yet serves as our high priest forever. And so we fail to, again, acknowledge his priesthood, his enduring priesthood, when we fail to tithe. Now, what is the significance of his priesthood? That he continues to plead your cause before God. You know, I never really understood how people who are a part of the, a Methodist group, denomination, it would, uh, like, but particularly the United Methodist Church, I don't know how, how many other denominations of the Methodist uh, denomination, how many others do this, but it was always a, a challenge to me that they got a new pastor every two, two years, or however long it was, that many times they would, they would vote the same person back in and they would stay in longer. But if, if, if I took two years connecting <laughs> with this person, they've been pouring into my life, I have to start all over again two years later potentially? That's tough. And it's tough when you lived your whole life when one person was the high priest, and now they're gone. And I just start off with somebody else. But I thank God that we have a high priest forever. Yes. And his name is Jesus. Yes. And the tithe acknowledges that he is still serving us yes. in the throne room of God. Oh, yes. Presenting his blood as a propitiation for our sin. Malachi chapter 3. Malachi chapter 3. Malachi chapter 3. It is the last book before the New Covenant, the New Testament. Last book of the Old Testament, Malachi, chapter 3. <clears throat> Malachi 3. Now, most people begin reading in verse 8. I will not begin reading there because that does not apply. I know that many pastors love to read it because they try to scare you in the title. <laughs> right? Yeah. Will a man rob God? But you have robbed me. Well, how have we robbed you? He said, well, in tithes and offerings. So therefore, you are cursed with the curse. Now, t t tell me something. If I'm under the blood of Jesus, which takes away all sin, which, has, which, has, which is all powerful, how can I be cursed? It is impossible. That's why I don't care about witches and hexes. I got a root stronger than your root. The root of Jesse. <laughs> so why am I afraid of what you're doing if I'm covered by the blood? So I am not cursed and God is not cursing me. If he said it ought not be so that blessings and curses come out of the same fountain, why would he bless me with the blood and then curse me with a curse? In fact, the new covenant specifically said that Christ died to take away the curse of the law. Mm -hmm. That's right. And pastors are afraid to teach this because they're terrified that if I teach this like it is, they'll stop tithing. But here's, if we start at verse 10, we'll see that there's still benefit to tithing. First of all, we already know that it's an acknowledgement that comes from the heart. But even if it's coming from the heart, God's still going to bless you. Because even though the curse is gone, the blessing remains. Yes. And here's the blessing. Bring the whole tithe, not part of it. Well, can I take some of it and give it to the poor? Because they are the ones who need it, and that's what God wants me to do with it. Somebody actually asked me that once. And I said, no. The tithe is not yours to give. You can't decide what to do with it. <laughs> Bring it into the storehouse. How are you going to help somebody else with my money? 
I don't mean the tithe. That's not mine. I'm just saying, if I loan you money, I loan it to you, and you turn around and help somebody else with it, give me my money back. If you don't need it, give it back to me. Right? Help them with your storehouse. And God is saying, you are just re re reappropriating what I call mine. So look what it says here. Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse so that there may be food in my house. Does his house still need food? It's a new covenant, but does hallelujah pay the light bill? We still need to meet in this house because as spiritual as we may be, this is still a monetary system we, we, we engage with. So the house still needs meat. Bring food in my house that, and test me now in this. Try me out and see, says the Lord of hosts, if I will not open for you the windows of heaven and pour out for you a blessing until that blessing overflows. You won't even have room enough to contain what I'm going to do in your life if you are faithful in your tithing. In your tithing, not in your offering, in your tithing. Then I will, re I will rebuke the devourable for your sake, uh, uh, for you, the New American Standard says, but the King James says, for your sake. And I love that for your sake, because it's good to know that God will do things for my sake. It's good to know that even though God sits on high, he's still concerned about my finances. And we always pray, you know, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, for thy name's sake. And we should be doing things for his sake. But I'm glad that while I'm doing things for his sake, he's going to be working on my behalf. Yes. Doing things for my sake, rebuking, rebuking the devourer for my sake. So that it may not destroy the fruits of the ground, nor will your vine in the field cast its grapes, says the Lord of hosts. And all the uncircumcised Philistines, all the heathens, all the non-believers, all the nations will call you blessed. Now here's a question. Do the nations walk by faith or by sight? By sight. by sight, not by faith. We call ourselves blessed by faith, even when we don't see it. The nations don't walk by faith. They walk by sight. If the nations call you blessed, it's because they saw something. Amen. If the nations call you blessed, it's because prosperity has manifested in your life. And the nations will call you blessed, for you shall be a delightful land, says the Lord of hosts. So the, the tithe, then, we understand now it comes from the heart. It is an acknowledgment that God is our provider. It is an acknowledgment that he still serves as our high priest. Yes, they did tithe under the new covenant. It was simply not commanded, but they did, in fact, tithe because it came from the heart. Now let's move into the first fruits. This is God's financial system. This is how God has set things up so that you, if you engage these principles in your finances, you're going to do things in your life. What is the benefit of tithing? Now, first of all, we do it out of love, out of acknowledgement. But what's the benefit? Blessings that you can't contain. Now, what are those blessings? Money. Too much money to fit in my account. No, he just said blessing. The windows of heaven, blessing. It could be health. It could be restored relationships. The tithe releases blessings from God that manifest many ways. All right? First fruits. Proverbs chapter 3. Proverbs 3. I hope that I'm not moving too fast, but I want to try to get through this before you all start falling asleep. Proverbs chapter 3. Beginning of, because you too broke to be asleep. Let's just get real about it. Let's just get real about it. I'm trying to save your life, you snoring. <laughs> Proverbs 3, beginning at verse 9. Honor the Lord from your wealth. Oh, this is not a part of the message, but hear this. Your wealth is not simply the income that you have. Wealth is what's actually stored. Amen. See, how often do our tithes, well, not, not the tithe because that comes off the income, how often do our offerings come out of our wealth? 
not just what was added in the last paycheck. How often do we honor him from our wealth? How often do you move over money from your savings account to the checking account because you want to honor him from your wealth? Did you, did you get that? Honor him from your wealth. And that means it's not the same thing. And uh, from the first of all your produce. So what is the result of this? Your barns will be filled with plenty. Your vats will overflow with new wine. Your barns will be filled with plenty. So now the first fruits, now watch what he says, the first fruits of all your produce. Now, their produce was significant because it was the economic system of the day. How were they going to be blessed in return for giving of their produce? By more produce. Their vats overflowing with new wine, barns filled with plenty. Now, the tithe manifests in all manner of areas in your life. The first fruits comes back in the same way you gave it. But it comes back in the same amount of overflow that the tithe produced. But it's coming back financially. Now, here's the question. Now, obviously, we're not living in an agrarian society right now, right? Our economics, our economy is, mo is, is money, okay? So that's how we actually give the first fruits. It's not through our produce, but it's through our money. Now, what is the first fruits? The first fruits was practiced as, as thus. And I've heard, oh God, I've heard this thing taught so many times and so many different ways. And sometimes you just sit there and kind of say, what? And it's really not that hard. The first fruit, and, and this is actually said elsewhere in scripture, is from the harvest. The first fruit is the first produce that you bring in from the harvest. And it's given annual. The first fruits is an annual quote unquote offering. Technically it's not an offering. But for lack of a better term, the first fruits is an annual gift that you give to God. And it is supposed to be comprised of the first day of your harvest. Now what is the first day of harvest? And I've heard this being taught and they said it means the first paycheck you get, you bring that paycheck to the Lord and give it to him. That's not what the first fruit is. If you get paid every two weeks, on your paycheck is 10 days worth of, worth of income. The first fruits is one day. And you only give it once a year. But it should be the first of the year. All right? So let's give me, let me give you some examples to make it practical you know how to do it. If you get paid every two weeks and you have 10 working days on your check, 10 days, then your first fruit will be one-tenth because that one-tenth will represent one working day. In that case, it's the same as your tithe. It's one-tenth, but you only give it uh, at the beginning of the year when you first get your first paycheck of the year, okay? If you get paid once a month, look on the check. How many working days are included in this? Take that number. If it's 24, take that number. Uh, divide the total that you receive, the gross, not the net, the gross, and divide it by the number of working days. And that is the amount of your first fruits. So if you got a $1,000 check, and if you got, let's say you got a $3,000 check, and there were 30 work days in that check, okay, then your first fruits will be $100 because you divide it by the number of days to see how much one day was worth. And the first fruits is not your whole check, it's one day. And as I, as I heard, would hear people, and I've heard it from more than one, as I would hear preachers tell people that the first fruit was the whole check, I said, everybody doesn't get paid the same. Some people get paid every week, some every two weeks, some once a month. You don't take their entire month's check. Why are they saying it? Because they want more of your money. Or they just don't understand it themselves. The first day's harvest was the first fruits under God. That's what you give. Y'all understand that? Yes. All right. Now, if you get a raise, this is now increase. 
that was not, a first fruits was not given on that increase. So here's what you do. You take the amount of the difference in your old paycheck and your new paycheck. The amount of difference is what your raise was. You don't have to give the whole difference because that whole difference includes all your work days. Divide that difference by the number of work days in the paycheck. And that's your first fruits. So you're doing the same exact thing that you did with the other first fruits, but you're only doing it on the difference now because you got a raise. And you only need to give the first fruit on the increase because you only do it once for the whole year. That makes sense? Why do you only give the first fruit once a year? Let's find out. Uh, Romans chapter 11. Romans 11. Now, as I am preaching this, there is no way for me to know if you are grasping how the first fruits is given. So please feel free to come and ask me at any time. Please feel free to ask me at any time. Now, here's a challenge. This is March. And I was challenged with, I said, God, because I, I told you all that I have been, this has been in my spirit for a long time, but he did not release me to do it. And I said, now, God, we're getting around December. I said, if I don't teach this, they're not going to know about the first fruits. But he didn't release me to do it. And all I could do is say, okay, I, I can't put, I can't move in my own mind and then tell God, you got to fix this later on, like we were talking about, <laughs> talking about earlier. Yeah, yeah. But here's the thing. God's time clock with us doesn't start the same for everybody. It starts when you know. And it's good because sometimes I didn't know, and even in my ignorance, he kept me. So if, you, if your first fruit was given in July, if your first fruit was given in March, the point is, spiritually, it still represents the first because you are walking into a new era of understanding. Now, Romans chapter... 11. Take a look at you, please. We're going to see some benefit associated with the first fruits. Put up, if you will, the King James Version of verse 16. The King James Version of verse 16. Romans 11, verse 16. For if the first fruit be holy, hey, glory, the lump, what's the first, the, the, the first is the, the little, the first portion you take out. If the lump, then the lump is also holy. If the root be holy, then so are the branches. I love, whenever I teach the first fruits, I give the example of Kool-Aid. We love Kool-Aid. I don't have to drink the whole container to make sure it's seasoned right. Do I have enough sugar? And by the time I figure it out, it's all gone. Right? I take one spoonful, and the one spoonful represents everything else in the container. See, if the first fruit be seasoned right, if the first fruit have enough sugar, hey, if the first fruit be holy, the lump is holy. If, if the first of your money for that year is holy, but here's the problem. If, if, the question is, God, how do I make the first holy? How do I make sure it's, it's sugared well enough? You give the first fruit. Because the, the giving of the first fruits makes everything that comes after it holy. And I want you to understand the power of that. The fact that it's holy means it is incapable of doing and accomplishing what regular money can accomplish. I got to say it again. I got to say that again. The fact that it's holy means it is incapable of doing what regular money can accomplish. It has to do more. It has to because it's touched by the hand of God. It has to. Turn to Ezekiel chapter 44. Ezekiel 44. 
Ezekiel 44. If, if, if the first fruit be holy, the lump is holy also. If you're there, say there. Yeah. Looking, if you please, at verse 30. Verse 30, Ezekiel 44, verse 30. And, and it reads thusly, And the first of all the first fruits of every kind and every contribution of every kind from all your contributions shall be for the priests. You shall also uh, give to the priest the first of your dough. Uh, it, it's going to accomplish something. It's going to do something. What is it going to do? To cause a blessing to rest on your house. To cause a blessing to rest on your house. So watch this now. In the giving of the first fruit, well watch now, be careful, when it's given the right way. Not only is the lump made holy, not only is it given supernatural anointing, See, the tithe didn't bless the money. Just the windows of heaven were opened up and blessings came out. The first fruit blesses your bank account itself. It blesses the money itself. But not only does it do that, but it also causes a blessing to rest on your house. But now here's the problem, and this is one of the reasons why the first fruits offering doesn't work in people's lives. Where is the first fruit supposed to be given? To the church. No. To the priest. The first fruits is supposed to be given to, and, and the, you know, we know that we're all kings and priests, but in the, in the manifestation of how this manifests or how it translates into the New Covenant era, as the priests were the ones who served in the temple, is given to the ones who serve. And we're going to get into this in more detail next week on why this works out this way. The whole sermon is going to be, ded be dedicated to this point. But the, the, the blessing is caused to rest on your house. How is a blessing conferred? The lesser is blessed by the greater. So in the same way, when Abraham put the tithe into Melchizedek's hand, well, it wasn't into his hand per se, it was much more than that. But the blessing was able to come back to Abraham because an exchange took place. Oh, that's good. I'm just preaching all through this sermon. Because we don't get taught this stuff. I've been saved a long time. I'm not that old, but I've been saved a long time. And we are just not taught this stuff. But when, but. What does it say? My people uh, perish for lack of knowledge. If we're not taught it, if we're not taught God's financial system, how can we activate its promises? He said he teaches us to profit. But we have to learn the system. Or we're too afraid the priest is going to buy a Rolex with our money. Can I ask a question? Why does it matter? Now, next week, uh, we'll deal with this. But here's the question. You ever heard the saying, so goes the head, so goes the body? You ought to want your leaders blessed. Because you trust that God, as they lead, and I follow, Paul said, follow me as I follow Christ. <laughs> it's like, I'm going to follow you in the poverty. No, I'm walking in rap. I'm walking in rap. <laughs> so, so you ought to want your leaders prosperous. And as I was, as I was meditating on this, I got to tell you this. As I was meditating on this, particularly when I got to the word dough, you know what that reminded me of? Power in the past. And I thought, you know, that's special. Yeah. I had never even heard of Pound of Passion until you all did it. Yeah. And I just thought, that is so special. 
But he'll say, even when you make a cake, give the first of the dough to the priest. He said, you're thinking about your leaders. And that matters. There's a passage in the New Testament, New Covenant, where he says, you don't want to base, I'm going to rephrase this. You don't want to stress out your leaders because they have to give an answer to God for your soul. They are looking out for your soul. Yes. So when you are blessing them, how can they not bless you? How can they not pronounce a blessing? And there's an exchange going forth here. You give the first fruit. You give the first of the dough, and they pronounce a blessing over your house. And they are empowered by God, by the agency of God. They are given an anointing to bless you. I know you thought you only needed Jesus. No, you need leaders. And you need leaders who know who they are, know the authority and power. They are. Do you realize we can pronounce stuff over your life? We can't even pronounce over our own. But he's anointed us over your life to speak into your life. But we can't just do it just because we want to. We are released to do it by the exchange that God has set up in his system. And we wonder, why is it not working? Because God said, I have not enabled you to pronounce the blessing until something is put in your hands. Otherwise, you are skirting my rule and be not deceived. God is not mocked. So you can't give them a shortcut to prosperity. They have to operate the principle. Do you see that? So we, we, don't even, we don't have the authority to step outside of our bonds. But if we ever told you, well, give the first fruits and we, and we can talk, you will go to Channel 5 and report us. <laughs> you know I'm right. And we probably wouldn't see you again. So we're afraid to tell you that because we love you so much. But the truth is, God set this thing up to work some kind of way. Let's turn this, uh, second, uh, to... Um, well, I'm going to head. Let's, let's slow down. You can also look in Nehemiah 10. Just write this down. You don't have to turn there. Just for further reinforcement of the first fruits, Nehemiah 10, verses 35 through 36. Verses 35 through 36. That also demonstrates how the first fruits is given for the priest. But once you make that first fruit holy, the lump is holy and the house is blessed. The lump is holy and the house is blessed. Now let's look at the offering. The offering is given differently than the other two. The offering is given based solely on your heart. There is no percentage, 10%. There is no measure, first day of labor. It's totally of your own volition. Whatever you choose to give, that is your offering. Generally, people call it the free will offering. Truthfully, all of these are free will. But they're coming from the heart, and that's where the promise is activated. The offering is where you show your affection to God financially. I'm going to prove this, but write this down. The offering is where you show your affection to God financially. We show our affection in many ways, but the offering is our financial affection. Not the tithe. The tithe is an acknowledgement that he is provider. The offering is where we show affection to him. Think of, the the, think of the tithe as a child with good behavior. The parent is happy because the child is acting right and they reward the child. Right? That's the tithe. All right? But how much more meaningful is it when on top of behaving, the child actually brings a gift to the parent and says, I love you. I was thinking about you. I had two dollars and I used it to buy you a gift. That's got to mean, I'm not a parent, but that's got to mean so much to parents. That the child, you use, you use it when buying them stuff. And they just bought just to say, I love you. That's the offering, saints. The offering is not just being obedient. The offering is, God, this is what I pour out into you from my heart. The tithe pleases the Father, but the offering melts his heart. The tithe pleases the Father, but the offering melts his heart. Because now you're not just giving him what he declared was his. You're pouring up of your own substance. 
just to tell them you love them. The tithe expresses reverence and humility. The tithe says, God, all I have comes from you, and I acknowledge that you are my provider, that you are my source. That is the tithe. But the offering expresses gratitude. It says, God, thank you for all you've done. God, thank you just for being who you are. So these, these are the, the different, I don't want to use the word spirit, they're the different character, they're the different personalities of the tithe and the offering. They come from two different places. Both places need to be expressed, but they come from two different places. Reverence and gratitude. Another aspect of the offering is that you are presenting to a king let me rephrase that. You are presenting to the king a gift that is worthy of him. Well, it's not worthy in the, in, in the greatest sense of the word, but it's something of worth and value to you. And that's what makes it meaningful to God. It is an act of presenting to the king something of worth and something of value to you as a way of honoring him. Now, in the ancient world, you would always bring a gift to the king. You would not go before the presence of a king without a gift. Even if you were a king yourself. The Bible said when the queen of Sheba came to Solomon, she brought him a gift. And then Solomon went and showed her how rich he was. He opened up the storehouse and showed her, and she fainted. The queen, who had her own treasury, fainted at the wealth of Solomon. Why? Because Solomon was connected to the source. So, uh, and even today, a head of state doesn't visit another head of state without bringing a gift usually. When the president goes to visit the queen of England, he's taking a gift because it shows you're honoring that person. So the principle even applies in the world system. And it should be the same way in the church. When we come to God, we should come with a gift because he is our king. And we acknowledge his kingship. When the three wise men Turn here. Turn to Matthew 2. It wasn't technically it wasn't three wise men, it was just three gifts they gave. But uh, Matthew chapter 2. Matthew 2. Beginning at verse 11. Beginning at verse 11, and it says this. And they, they being the wise men, they came into the house and saw the child, Christ, with Mary his mother. And they fell down and worshipped him. And opening their treasures, they presented to him gifts of gold and frankincense and myrrh. They presented to him gold and frankincense and myrrh. Now, why did these wise men, other translation, magi, other translations say kings, why did these kings from the east bring gifts to this child? Skip up to verse 2. The, the king, the, 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 the magi from the east arrived in Jerusalem and they said, where is he who had been born king of the Jews? They brought gifts because even though they were kings, they were coming to a king. Even though he was too young to talk, they were still coming to a king. And you don't go before a king empty-handed, even as a king. You present gifts to the king. You are kings and you are priests unto God, but you still come before his presence bearing gifts. Now, I know it's a challenge. Sometimes, God, I don't have anything to bring. Go through your, listen, go through your pillow cushions. Lift up the couch. There are pennies and quarters. You think the dollar amount matters to him? No. It matters what's coming from your heart. A woman took all she had, one penny, but she gave it to the king, and it impressed him. It's about what comes from the heart. And if all you have is a penny, give it. I promise you, the gift that moves you to give it moves him to receive. The gift 
that it doesn't move you to give. It doesn't move him to receive. And we found that out in Malachi chapter 1. I don't want to turn there. I talked about it some weeks ago. It was a word of exhortation, and we looked at it. But I encourage you to read Malachi chapter 1, because in that chapter, God pours out his heart. I mean, to read it and really think about what you're reading, it's like he had a broken heart. He said, you, you say that you, know, that you honor me, but a son honors his father. He said, where is my honor? And they said, well, God, well, why, how have we dishonored you? He said, because you hate my table. You have brought blind lambs and gave them as offerings. The lame and the sick, that's what you gave to me. He said, offer that now to your governor and see if he will be pleased with you. But you bring it to me and you call me your father? You tell me I'm good to you, but you give me the junk you have left over that it won't hurt you to miss. I'm telling you, read Malachi 1. It is powerful. If nothing changes your view of offerings, read Malachi 1. Read Malachi 1. Okay? Uh, Genesis chapter 8. Genesis chapter 8. Saints, your reprieve is coming. I am inching toward the conclusion. But it is my prayer that you are really getting this. I'm trying to move as fast as I can without sounding like I'm speaking in tongues. <laughs> but I want to make sure that we get this because once we know what we are doing, when you, when you do the right thing for the wrong reason, it's good that you did the right thing, but you're not activating the potential and the power of what you're doing because you didn't do it for the right reason. But when you line up the right thing with the right reason, and you can't understand the right reason until you understand what the Bible says about it. So now you know about the tithe and what it represents and why we should give it even though it's not commanded. Now you know about the, the, the first fruits and how to give it and what it accomplishes in your life when you do give it. Now you're learning about the offering and how to give it. All right? Genesis chapter 8. <clears throat> I want you not to think as the offering as being money that is given. I want you to think of it as being a seed that is sown. Some of you all may remember a few years ago, I preached about this, about, probably about two years ago, about uh, the principle of seed time and harvest. But think about the tithe as being what you pay. Think about the, about, about, about the first fruits as being what you give. Think about the offering as being what you sow. Okay? Genesis 8, verse 22. Watch this. <clears throat> Genesis 8, 22. While the earth remains, these principles shall not cease. What? Seed time and harvest, cold and heat, summer and winter, day and night. And here we are thousands of years later, and these principles are still made manifest. One of those everlasting and eternal laws is, I should call it everlasting, one of those everlasting laws is the law of seed time and harvest. Understand that seed time and harvest is a law. If you plant a seed, unless the seed is dead, something will come up if you plant it. And of course you have to water it. But the, the principle, this is how our entire society evolved. You could, they, because it was a law, and this was how it always worked. They were able to activate principles of agriculture that changed their lives. The human population was able to grow because seed time and harvest was a law. Once you know a law and you know how it works, you can use it to your advantage. Because it always works. It's a law. Gravity is a law. Physics are a series of laws. How do you think that we were able to make it to the moon? How do you think that the Hubble telescope is able to look quintillions of miles away and actually see things and make it big enough with a high enough resolution that we see what we're looking at? How is that? Because it's a law. And once they learned how the laws worked, then we were able to... Why, how is your cell phone working? Laws. You turned it around and the whole screen adjusted. That's a law. And Steve Jobs said, I think I'll put that law to use. And he created the iPhone. 
So we, we, we're able to develop technology. We're able to do whatever we do because we learn about the laws. Why did you sit in that seat? Weren't you afraid you would fall straight to the floor? No. Because I believe, based on the law, that that seat would hold me up. Why don't you, since you're so holy and saved and sanctified with your saved self, go to the ceiling, run and jump and say, I'm a bird. <laughs> you're a king and a priest, right? So go do it. Even though you're a king and a priest, there's a law. And it's called gravity. And your king self will be flattened out like a pancake. <laughs> because it's a law. There's one time that the laws are broken or don't work. And that's when God steps in. You know what we call those? Miracles. But do you realize God is not simply trying to perform miracles in your finances? He wants you to learn the laws. So you can start working some things out on your behalf. All right? So let's look at uh, Galatians chapter... No. Let's go first to 2 Corinthians chapter 9. 2 Corinthians 9. How does this law work? It's the law of seed, time, and harvest. Now, when people hear seed, time, and harvest, they only think agriculture. They only think literal seeds. But God used that principle to convey a lot of principles of Scripture, to convey a lot of notions. Jesus talked about seed, time, and harvest in referring to the Word. He said the Word was a seed, and it was only when it was planted in good ground that it brought forth a harvest. Right? When it fell upon the stony ground, all the thorns of life came and sucked it away. It fell upon the, the, the rough ground and the birds came and ate it away. So he, he likened the word itself to this law. He likened the kingdom of God. He said, to what shall we liken the kingdom of God? It is like a sower who went to sow seed. Yeah. Yeah. So, he, so this, this principle applies to many things, not just uh, agriculture, but it also applies to money. 2 Corinthians chapter 9, beginning of verse 6. Beginning at verse 6. 2 Corinthians chapter 9, beginning at verse 6. And it says this. Now this I say, he who sows sparingly shall also reap sparingly. Well, uh, uh, what are you sowing what? Are you, wait, are you talking about sowing us? Uh, uh, agriculture? No. Read the context and you will see clearly he's talking about money. Read the whole chapter and you'll see it. But for the sake of time, we won't do it now. Now this I say, he who sows sparingly shall also reap sparingly, and he who sows bountifully shall also reap bountifully. Notice he didn't say anything about God making you reap. It's just a law. <laughs> okay. This is going to hurt some of our weight. We love to think about certain things a certain way because it makes us feel all warm and fuzzy inside. I am not black because God performed a miracle. <laughs> now, if I was born Chinese, that would be a miracle. Why? Because my mother and my father are black. Right? When, when God formed us, yeah, but understand that he's speaking poetically. The forming he did was Adam. The forming he did was Eve. But in forming them, he put laws in place. So the chromosomes and the genes begin to mix. The, the semen hit the egg. It didn't cause a miracle. The miracle was Christ. But everybody else, that's biology. So what happens here is the laws are put into place. And so now that the laws are in place, He's no longer needing to actually be directly involved in every single thing that possibly happens. That's Calvinism. And it's not accurate. There is no need for laws if God is the great puppeteer on high, making everything work. That's right. That's right. So the genes and genetics, the biology works because he put a law into place. They did not give birth to a cow because laws are in place. And things reproduce after their own kind. Now, you may think I look like one, but I am a human being. 
Now, in the same way, God was not the one causing the bountiful reaping. There was a law in place. And he said, if you would sow bountifully, you will reap bountifully. Just because the law is in place. Do you see that? Amen. All right, now, you never get back, when you sow a seed, you never get back a seed. But when you eat a seed, all you ate was the seed. So, uh, verse, verse 7. So let each one do as he has purposed in his heart, because remember, the offering, the seed you sow, there is no command, there is no percentage, there is no measure. It is what's in your heart to give. Don't give grudgingly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. Now skip down if you will to verse 10. Now, he who supplies seed to the sower. Say, well, is God involved at all? Yeah, he's the one who gave you seed to sow. <laughs> And he does not just provide seed to the people. He provides seed to the sowers. If he can't trust you to sow the seed and not consume it, why would he provide it to you? And you ask the question, God, there is no seed in my life. Ask what you, ask, don't ask him, ask yourself what you did with the last seed he gave you. He who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food. Now watch this. Don't think that because God is so spiritual minded, he's not concerned about you having what you need. He is going to feed you. He provides seed to the sower and bread for food. But if you are so greedy that you eat the bread and the seed because you wanted the nicest car on the lot, you wanted the biggest house on the, on the, on the, in the neighborhood, so you took all, you never stopped and said, God, how much of this is seed? You took all of it and spent it on you. Then God said, I can't trust you with seed. And two years later, you lost a $400,000 house for $5,000 in back taxes. Because he couldn't trust you to sow the seed. Good God. Now he, verse 10, who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food, will supply and multiply, will supply and multiply. He's multiplying it because now he can trust you to sow it. He will supply and multiply your seed for sowing, and he will also increase, watch this, the harvest. The harvest of your righteousness. There are two primary elements involved in the law of seed, time, and harvest. They are seed and harvest. They are seed and crop. Your seed was never meant, meant to minister to your presence. Your seed ministers to your future. Harvest ministers to your present. If you eat the seed, you are condemning your future. Because not only will you not have a harvest because nothing was planted, you also won't have more seed because he can't trust you with it. So now you're stuck doing what? Working the world system. And you're not getting anywhere. And you're complaining and whining. I never get nowhere. The man not making it work. That's because you're serving that man and not that one. When you put his law into practice, what that man gives you will multiply. Galatians 6, and I'm going to take my leave. Galatians 6. I want to thank you all for your indulgence. But well, we are learning this thing because we want to see God's promises made manifest in our lives. I'm tired of hearing about it. I want to see it. But in order for the nations to call me blessed, that means they saw it. Yes. It's time to start yes. seeing some stuff. Yes. Galatians 6, beginning at verse 7. Do not be deceived. Do not be deceived. Do not be deceived. 
God is not mocked. What does he mean by God is not mocked? I thought you said God wasn't doing the one. No, he's not. But God is the one who created the law. And God saying, I will not let you take a shortcut because that will skirt my law. And I am not mocked. If you plan to reap, you have to sow. God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, that will he also reap. Okay. How is the tithe returned? Blessings that manifest many ways. Houses you didn't build. Crops you didn't sow as the, as the you know, in, in, in the saying, as they said in scripture. Manifest many ways. Healing. How is the first fruit returned? Favor in your house, the blessing on your house, right? How is the offering returned? However you gave it. Why? It's a law. I'm a human because the seed that, that sowed me was human seed. Your offering, oh, I wish the people would teach this right. Your offering is not going to bring you healing. But it could buy the medicine that will. That a tithe could manifest in healing. We, it can manifest many ways. But it's a law that whatever a man sows, that shall he also reap. But he's going to always reap it in greater amount than he sowed it. You never sow a seed and get back a seed. Watch this. You'll get back a tree bearing seed. The tree itself has both food and more seed. He provides seed to the sower and bread for food. If you sold it and if you labored diligently and faithfully to wait until it grew up, you didn't see the first sprout fast enough, so you ran out and got it some other kind of way. But it takes time for the law to work. Yeah. That's why he goes on in the next verse, verse 8, and he says this. Well, the one, well, he really says this verse 9, but the one who sows his flesh and flesh. Now watch this. We read this verse in this context and we think, oh, he's not talking about money. He's talking about the spirit. No saints, he's talking about money. If you, if you keep it in, we always talk about context. Keep it in context. You read verse 6, and you'll see he is talking about money. For the one who sows his own, you sow to your own flesh in money too. Will reap of, of the flesh, reap corruption. The one who sows to the spirit will from the spirit reap eternal life. Verse 9, let us not be weary. Let us not lose heart in sowing faithfully. Because in due time we will reap if we do not grow weary. In due season we shall reap if we faint not. But you have got to be faithful. Do not think that you are going to sow one offering, walk away, and everything in your life is going to be right. It takes time for the tree to grow up. But if you tend to it, if you prune it, yes. if, you let, if you water it, the promise will come to pass, but you've got to be faithful. God's system is not a get-rich-quick scheme. And we've been teaching it like one because we wanted to encourage you to give. But I need you to understand something. I can't bring increase into your life. I can water. Said one man plant, one man water, but God provides the increase. And he provides it in his own time. Yes. But you have got to be found faithful when the time for harvest comes. If you are not still out there in that field, if you have gotten distracted by the cares of life, that stuff will over-ripen and die. You've got to be out there daily, consistently in the field, and you'll know just when it's right, and you'll take it, and things will start to change because now you have food and seed. So take these principles.
take these prints. Notice that he said it in the tithe. Try me now in this. Notice that he says here with the off with the seed. God is not mocked. He is putting his reputation on the line with this financial system. That's how much he wants to prosper you. Think about it. When he talked about, put up verse 6. We started at verse 7. I want to prove it to you that he's talking about finances. The one who is taught the word is to share all good things with the one who teaches him. Put up verse 7. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. What is he saying? He's saying there is no way to bring you into a harvest until you learn how to become a seed sower. And God said, I want you to reap, but you have to plant the seed. You have to activate principles. I, I challenge you, go home and reflect on this. Go over your notes. This will be put on a line like the other sermons. Watch it. Get to that site and watch these sermons. Have it planned while you're cooking dinner. Have it planned while you're in the car on the way home. Since the time will give you a CD, you don't, have to, you don't have to pay anything for it. Just go back there and get one. Get this word in your spirit because faith comes by hearing and more faith by more hearing. Condition yourself. Wash away all of that bad way of thinking. Recondition your mind, recondition your thinking to these principles so that they become second nature. When I first began to learn how to code, I had to have all of the different commands. Either I had to have a cheat sheet where I can reflect on it, or I put it down in a, note, in a notebook. And when I wrote it myself, I learned it faster because when you write, you learn stuff faster. But after a while, before I knew it, I knew all the commands by heart. It's very rare that I even reference a manual now because all of the code is in my head. Why? Because I constantly refer to it over and over and over again. It's good to take good notes. I challenge you, take good notes. But don't just take them. Study them. Read them. Say them out loud to yourself so your ears can hear it and process it. Hear the sermon again, again. Build your faith so that you can be, this become, become second nature to you. And you do it on autopilot. I told the praise team, learn these notes, learn these lyrics, so that when you're singing it, you're able to flow into worship without even having to concentrate on the notes and concentrate on the part. Can you imagine giving and it's second nature? What you, we say, how do you know how much is seed and how do you know how much is bread? There's only one person who can tell you that. God. Ask him. When you get that pen out, don't just, what do I want to give? Ask him. God, how much of this seed have you entrusted me with? And when he tells you, write that down. You may want to even write more because not only is there seed, but now there's something a little extra coming from your heart. But ask him about it. Don't never get out an envelope without consulting him. You don't want to consume your seed. But there comes a time when you have practiced it enough that it becomes second nature. And when that happens, good God, when he will not be released to do in your life. You say, why is God being released? You saying he's bound up now? Yes. He's bound by his word. He is not mocked. So that is the challenge I leave for you today. We're going to go further into this um, in the next session, but I, I tell you, time. First fruits and offerings are what we call seed. Next week, we're going to look at what I call water. Tithes that are paid, first fruits that are given, seed that is sown, and next week comes water that is poured. Amen.